Welcome to First Look, a Bible study looking ahead to the reading or readings for the coming Sunday. My name is Carl and it's great to have you with us. This week we're looking at an encounter between Jesus and some of the leading Pharisees and thinking about hospitality, humility and status. Before we dive into that, however, if you've not done so already, you may find it useful to download the sheet that accompanies this study. And you can find the link for that in the video description in YouTube. On the sheet, you will find the text of today's reading, some other passages you may wish to look up, the questions we'll be considering together later on, and lots of room for you to record your own thoughts and observations. And so without further ado, let's dive into this week's passage, which comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 1 and verses 7 through to 14. We're continuing our look through Luke's travel narrative, which sees Jesus going on the road from Galilee to Jerusalem and thereby covers chapter 9, verse 51, all the way through to chapter 19, verse 27. On the way, Jesus had been invited into the house of a leading Pharisee on the Sabbath day, as we learn about in verse 1. And that meant, because of how dining customs and hospitality and shared meals worked in that context, that he was being treated by the Pharisees as an equal. And yet, we also learn in verse 1 that they were keeping an eye on him. Using similar logic to that which he had in chapter 13, verses 10 to 17, Jesus argued that it was acceptable for him to cure a man with dropsy on the Sabbath day, arguing from what was allowed in terms of work on that day when most work was not permitted. And his opponents, as we learn in verses 1 to 6 through this episode, had stayed silent as he'd acted. He then, observing them getting ready to eat and taking their places, launched into a parable that was about being a humble guest before talking about being a selfless host. And as we'll see, our passage divides up into that parable, covering verses 7 to 11, and then this later teaching about being a selfless host in verses 12 to 14. So in this passage, most obviously we've got Jesus, who was on his way to Jerusalem, sharing fellowship at another's table and not being afraid to be somewhat critical of his host and of his fellow guests. He'd been invited to dine by a Pharisee, a leading member of the Pharisee party, which was one of the major factions within the Judaism of the day and tended to have quite a strong focus on holiness. And also Jesus was dining with various other guests of this leading Pharisee. And we know from verse 3 of chapter 14 that this included some other Pharisees and some lawyers, the very people Jesus was challenging with his Sabbath healing. And no doubt they were other leading Jewish figures of the day. They were prominent other Pharisees and and lawyers. And that fits with how Greco-Roman dining customs worked out, as I'll say a bit more about later on. Luke's Gospel was the third of the four canonical Gospels to be written, around 80 to 85 of the Common Era, and it forms a two-volume work. We've got Luke's Gospel and the Book of Acts, so what we have here is kind of part one of that. And one of the key themes running throughout Luke's Gospel, taking us into Acts, is that of shared meals and table fellowship. So we find some interesting examples around that, for example, in chapter 5, verse 29, chapter 7, verse 36, and chapter 11, verse 37. This particular episode that we're looking at today is one of those that's unique to Luke's Gospel. And of the four, Luke does place the greatest level of emphasis on table fellowship. 
So in this passage, which includes a short parable followed by a few sayings, there are some other texts that it's helpful for us to keep in mind as we read it. If we look at Sirach, which was a Jewish wisdom text, specifically Sirach 31 verses 12 to 18, we find quite a bit of advice and guidance on how to behave in the context of these shared meals, shared formal meals. A lot of talk about humility and deference, which I think shaped the approach of many of the fellow guests at this meal. And we also have various examples we could find in Luke's Gospel of status reversal, if I could put it like that. So in chapter 1, verses 48 and 52, we've got some snapshots from Mary's Magnificat. In chapter 6, verses 20 to 26, we've got uh, an, another um, early reversal account during Jesus' Galilean ministry. And as we get quite close to Jerusalem, we have another example in chapter 18, verse 14. Now, social rank, social status was a key feature of um, dining and meals and table fellowship in Greco-Roman culture. How it would work is your table would be arranged a bit like a kind of letter U with your host at the head of the table, the highest ranking guest sat closest to the host and then working their way down, getting further away from the host with the lowest ranked guests present. And meals were therefore settings in which social disparities were highlighted and accentuated. We know from verse 1 that the Pharisees present were watching Jesus very closely in that setting and the word that's used is peritorio and it means a, a watchfulness that has a kind of sinister side to it. There's an intention to trap and to catch out there and it may be in response to things that Jesus has done on other Sabbath days, for example, in chapter 6, verse 7, the healing of a man with a withered hand in a synagogue, and through to chapter 20, verse 20, some of the things he will say and do in Jerusalem itself. So Jesus was being watched and had, in the verses that our lecture leaves out for this week, performed a Sabbath healing, which had silenced some of his opponents. Now we focus more on the banquet itself and in verse 7 we're told that Jesus was watching the guests take the seats of honour for themselves and that sparked a whole section of teaching about meals and status and hospitality and honour and so forth which actually covers all the way from verse 8 through to verse 24. Now it was perfectly normal in the customs of that day for people to take the seats of honour because, as I say, there was this sort of model of, of, of status but also humility, while being an important Christian virtue, was not one that was prized in Greco-Roman culture. If anything, the opposite was true in that culture. One was supposed to big oneself up and, and seek to achieve status and honour. And one way to do it was by having these kinds of meals with the expectation that one would get a return invitation and that, that also would act as a way of boosting one's, one's status. So there was a lot of stuff going on as Jesus began to teach and the first part of what we're looking at here in verses 8 to 11 is the parable of the wedding banquet, the wedding guests. Humility, as I say, was a central Christian virtue, and we see that borne out, for example, in what we find in the Magnificat in Luke chapter 1, verses 48 and 52, and also later on in chapter 18, verse 14. But we also find it in various Pauline texts, for example, in Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, and in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, the prelude to that beautiful hymn about Jesus not grasping his equality with God but humbling himself. And we also find it, for example, in the epistle of James in chapter 3, verse 13. So it's a key New Testament theme runs throughout the various works. Now, in this particular parable of a wedding banquet, Jesus no, does not 
criticise this system of honour and different seats at the table. But instead, I think, he tells his listeners how to navigate it and perhaps even how to subvert it, as much as it takes that system as a central presupposition of the parable. The setting of the parable, as we learn in verses 8 and 9, is that of a wedding banquet. And that imagery looks ahead to the heavenly banquet when the kingdom of God comes in all of its fullness. The guests are advised not to seek the places of honour as would be standard behaviour in order to avoid the humiliating situation of the host coming along and demoting them very publicly so that they have to make way for someone of greater prominence. Rather in verse 10, the guests are advised to take the lowest rank seats first so that they would avoid a harsh word from their host and a very public displacement and they'd be moved up the pecking order and achieve greater honour thereby in the presence of the other guests, having been addressed by the host as friend. And this parable, this countercultural parable, ends in verse 11 with one of Jesus' famous aphorisms about the self-exalted being humbled and the humble being exalted. So as I say, given humility was not seen as a virtue in Greek and Roman culture, it kind of turns things upside down. And the sayings that we find on honour and status in verses 12 to 14, if anything, go even further. It's profoundly countercultural stuff, cutting right to the heart of Greco Roman norms, norms and social values by challenging this idea of um, reciprocity, which was so central to Roman ideas around patronage and inviting um, guests who were honourable to increase one's, one's status. It was quite normal, therefore, for a host to invite their family and their friends and wealthy guests in anticipation of a corresponding invitation in return. And so the Pharisee, this powerful leading Pharisee, was just doing what was normal and expected. But Jesus says, don't do that. Instead, invite people who've been pushed to the margins. We see in verse 13, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind, as the NRSV translates that verse, in a way that echoes Jesus's Isaiah themed manifesto in chapter 4 verses 18 and 19 where it talks about liberating the oppressed and giving sight to the blind and proclaiming the year of the Lord's favour. And as the beginning of verse 14 shows, that should be done precisely because those are the very people who will not be able to reciprocate. So in other words, it's offering hospitality without expecting necessarily to receive anything back in return. So instead of looking for an increase in social status through return invitations, the end of verse 14 talks about looking for God's repayment with the resurrection of the righteous. In other words, when we get the coming of the kingdom in all of its fullness. Kingdom relations, therefore, are shown not to be based on mutual benefits, mutual patronage in society. So there's a lot going on in this passage and it's important to remember that this was a section of Luke's Gospel where Jesus was talking to powerful, wealthy, high status people and showing them how instead of bigging themselves up even further they should aim for humility in how they conduct themselves. I wonder how this passage might read to somebody within that set of marginalised people that Jesus talks about, or indeed other marginalised groups today. I think the calling there would not necessarily be to one of humility, but of basically standing tall and taking up one's full place, one's full room, as it were, in the kingdom of God, recognising oneself as equally valuable in God's eyes to the rich and the powerful and the worldly um, people with um, that kind of status and, and, and accolades. It's a really powerful text in the sense it reminds us that who we are definitely reflects what we will get out of this passage.
and that now leads us into our questions for this week. Thank you.